All right. Welcome to another episode of Mormon Discussion Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Real. Grateful for the chance to be with you today. We are going to do just a simple slideshow. Folks, if you can hear me, just give me a comment that just says the sound is all good. I'll try to keep the mic a little closer to me. Um, we'll get right to it. I'm going to put up on the screen a, a slideshow. And uh, we'll uh, do this. I'm just saying, quick tell me how to respond with someone's name. I get a report or mute option. I don't I don't know how that works, Swanee. Uh, glad everybody's here, though. If somebody is uh, posting uh, way too much, then I will uh, give them a timeout over here on this side. But I do welcome questions, by the way. When we get through uh, the back end of this, I might even take some live calls if folks do want to call in a question. Uh, the reason this is a big deal is because, again, I think I emphasized this about a month ago when we covered this topic. Um, there's a, a, a growing group of people who believe that Joseph Smith didn't practice polygamy. What I think is going on here is that folks, because the LDS church is being more transparent with its history, there are more of us, by us I mean either Mormons or former Mormons, who now have the facts and documents and the history in front of them and Mormonism as a collective religion with all of its different uh, denominations of, of Mormonism, all its breakoff groups, Mormonism is uh, dealing with the fact that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And again, I, I, I mean that respectfully towards the polygamy denier group. I'm hoping that you will listen to this. I'm hoping that for one hour, hour and a half or so, you'll just set your bias aside for a minute and try to understand where I'm coming from and understand what it is that I'm pointing to. Because I actually think what I'm pointing to is so overwhelming against your conclusion that I don't know how to reconcile it. And I would welcome, if you can understand the math that's going on today, if you can help me reconcile, I would love that. So folks, um, about a month ago, Radio Free Mormon and I covered on Mormonism Live uh, what we thought was the contemporary evidence that showed that Joseph Smith was, in fact, uh, a polygamist. And this even goes back further. It was maybe a year ago or so that we did an episode on Flora Woodworth, one of Joseph Smith's plural wives, who received a watch. And we went into detail about that story. There was an instance where Joseph had to use extreme measures to quiet Emma down. And we talked about all the details of that, uh, including Orange White's testimony, who was Lyman White's son, about what he knew about that relationship. And so then about a month ago, we did an episode on something else and somebody at the end called and they were not believers in Joseph Smith as a polygamist. And I said, okay, fine. Next Sun or next Wednesday, uh, RFM and I will just cover this topic and we will present the contemporary evidence that Joseph Smith was in fact a polygamist. And I won't be able to follow the comments super closely, but uh, along the way, we we will hopefully um, point out a couple of them. And, and again, when we get to the end, I would welcome live calls, If, if but it's going to stay on topic. We're going to talk about what I presented today or other parts of this story in terms of the evidence presented showing Joseph Smith is a polygamist. And I welcome feedback or any sort of pushback if, if something here doesn't make sense. So let's start with, uh, I'll go to the first slide here. When we talked uh, about a month ago about Joseph Smith being a polygamist, there was this one journal entry from William Clayton where he says, you know, Jay told me to deed all of the unencumbered uh, lots to Emma Smith because she appear, or he appears troubled about Emma. Uh, he talks about how Emma didn't believe a word of it. She appeared very rebellious. Again, the polygamy deniers need the Clayton journals to not be contemporary to Smith. They need Brigham Young to be ordering Clayton and others in the in the in the church to be altering the documents. And by the way, polygamy deniers, I agree that Brigham Young and others after him altered LDS history. I just put up on Facebook a revelation by Joseph Smith where he claims that he was visited by both Adam and Michael. And uh, that original revelation we have where it says that Joseph spoke to or was visited by Adam and Michael. And then it also talks about, a, it's, a, it's a revelation also predicting or prophesying that Brigham Young will do certain things and he doesn't. He doesn't actually end up doing those things. And it also prophesies that the current 12 apostles as constituted in the church at the moment Joseph Smith 
is receiving that revelation, they will all end up in the celestial kingdom. Mm, several of them, many of them apostatized. And, and so that also didn't turn out to be true. And then when the church publishes the revelation, they take out the portions that don't come true and they correct the air by Joseph Smith because just a couple years earlier, he had said that Michael and Adam were the same person. And here he is claiming they're separate people. And so the church then edits that document, puts, publishes the revelation without those parts in it. So I'm well aware that the church has a history of hiding things. I'm well aware that the church has a history of, of trying to obscure uh, its information when that information is troubling. I don't disagree with that. But on a case-by-case -case basis, when it comes to the Clayton diaries, again, not a lot of people have seen them, but we can understand specifically from this entry that this entry has uh, some provenance to it. Because not only is he telling us about DNC 132, and not only uh, is he telling us that uh, Emma is upset. By the way, whatever Emma saw, it has to be something that upset her and that she did not believe a word of. So we have to come up with a reasonable solution for what that is. But it's not just that. It's that when we go to the actual deed of Emma from that uh, moment, let me, oop, let me do this. Let me get out of there. Oops. Give me just a second, folks. Manning all this myself. And uh, I'm going to just make this page bigger. So this is the deed by Emma. And what we find out from this one is that she actually is encumbered all, uh, she's, she's given all of the un unencumbered lots. And it's a long uh, lot deed. She's given all of them and it just names them one after the other. And so for the polygamy deniers, you, you would have to then go, these guys are, the conspiracy theory goes so far and she's so smart that or that he's so smart, Brigham Young or William Clayton, whoever, that they go back into these deeds and they take the deed and then scour all of them for information and then place them back into the contemporary historical narrative. And that just is absurd. You have to have a line at some point where you're asking for too much. And so when we look at the Clayton uh, journal entry, it's this idea that whatever Emma's frustrated about, Joseph gets troubled and he tells William Clayton to deed all of the unencumbered lots to Emma and the children. And this is on the 12th of July, 1843. On the same day, later in the day, Emma Smith is deeded all of the unencumbered lots. And it's the only deed that's like this. Uh, it's a $10,000 deed. It's the only deed of that price. It's the only deed with all of that land. Uh, so that's one. And, and this isn't, by the way, this isn't the smoking gun. This is just what I consider to be really strong evidence that the William Clayton journal entry, at least this one, has provenance. And as you heard Brian Buchanan say on our episode, uh, these aren't really questioned by historians. And, and not just historians for the church, historians from multiple vantage points. So there's that. Okay, next. There's I put the deed up there too as well. So there's all the text. If you want to read it, you can pause it. But she is given all the unencumbered lots. It fits perfectly with the William Clayton journal entry. And these deeds, I mean, if you're going to start questioning that these deeds are all tampered, we'll show you later. But that, that becomes a really difficult argument. All right. The other thing that we presented uh, that night that I think at least should be noted here is that when you go into Clayton, Clayton understands, I'm going to go back one here. Clayton understands that this is the designs in Moses, Abraham, and Solomon having many wives and concubines after uh, it was wrote. Da, da, da. Okay. So this is idea that he's talking a little bit about the context of D&C 132. Then when you get to the Nauvoo Expositor, uh, William Law talks about some of the parts that are in D&C 132. Jane Law talks about parts that are in D&C 132, including, by the way, the Law of Sarah, which might be the worst part of D&C 132. And then you've got Austin Cowles on the right-hand side leaving his affidavit, and he is also sharing parts of D&C 132. RFM just did a complete episode on this. The point being is that while the polygamy deniers, they don't believe whatever the original document is, they agree it troubled people. They agree that Hiram read it in the high council meeting. They, they agree that it, uh, 
that the Nauvoo Expositor, they can't write, a, they can't dismiss its provenance. They know it's a contemporary document. So they would have to agree that Austin Cowles, Jane Law, William Law, not William Clayton, but at least these three are actually speaking about the substance of that document. Here's the thing. When you go to DNC 132, verse 1, verse 15, verse 50, uh, I believe it's 53 and 54, but 54, uh, verse 26 and 27, verses 38 and 39, and verse 62, those verses contain the very theology that the Nauvoo Expositor, by the way, this is not a repeat, folks, stick with me. Uh, I'll get to the smoking gun here in just a moment. I just want to cover the main important pieces of evidence that we covered that night, because each of these things are things that the polygamy deniers don't really address. They have some wide, broad brush that they dismiss it with, but they actually don't dig into this stuff. So DNC 132, there is a whole plethora of verses that are testified to by Austin Cowles, Jane Law, William Law, and William Clayton. Again, they they want to dismiss Clayton. I find that really difficult with the Emma Smith land deed, but they do. All right. So the other thing that I thought that night was really a big deal is that in that Nauvoo High Council meeting, there, there is a list of people we knew, know are present. Some of them never leave their witness behind, but most of them do. And every single person in the Nauvoo High Council who saw the original document testifies that that document was, in fact, Section 132 of the DNC. And that includes, by the way, again, Austin Cowles, William and Jane Law, also William Clayton, but the polygamy deniers dismiss him, so be it. And you can't, even if you dismiss William and Jane Law as apostates, which I think is a, a horrible thing, you can't take every single witness who goes with Brigham Young or leaves the church and make them all untrustable just with a sweeping motion of the hand. Instead, you really have to deal with the merit of what they're saying. And the reason William and Jane Law fell out of favor with the church is because of polygamy. By the way, same with Austin Cowles. So, Every one of these witnesses, now some of these witnesses stayed with the LDS church. And I honestly, polygamy deniers, honestly, if that was the only witnesses we had, I might even agree with you. If we had good documentation that the Clayton journals in the instances we're using were doctored or altered, I'd agree with you. If there was a way to dismiss the provenance of the Nauvoo Expositor, I would agree with you. But I can't. Because that's not how historical analysis works. So when I look at um, these testimonies from David Fulmer, Aaron Johnson, James Allred, Thomas Grover, those are the ones that were part of the members who, and James Allred too, by the way, those were the ones of those who stayed with the LDS church. We can take those out. You have William Law and Jane Law and Austin Cowles, who their motivations are completely different. Austin Cowles doesn't stay with the church. William and Jane Law don't stay with the church. And then you've got this one, Leonard Sobey, which really stands out. Leonard Sobey leaves two affidavits behind. But here's the thing. Understand the story. Leonard Sobey, a member of the high council who rejected the revelation and apostatized, was living in New Jersey in 1883. President Smith of the reorganized church. This is Joseph Smith III. Okay. President Smith of the Reorganized Church sent to Mr. Sobey to secure his affidavit that he did not hear the revelation read. Mr. Sobey told the messenger, if you will draw up an affidavit setting forth that I was there and I did hear the revelation, I will sign it for you. He did sign the latter kind of a document, and Mr. Gurley, who was the messenger, apostatized from the Reorganized Church because he had to confront the fact that he had believed that Joseph Smith Jr. didn't practice polygamy. And here's Leonard Sobey, a credible witness in the Nauvoo High Council, who is completely against polygamy, leaves the LDS church. The reorganized church goes to him knowing that if anybody's going to, Leonard Sobey's going to set the record straight. And Leonard Sobey agrees 
with all of the other folks from before him and says, no, like, I don't like polygamy. I definitely was against it, but Joseph Smith did that. Hiram Smith read it. That's real. It is DNC 132. By the way, notice the bottom of this, I believe. Two members of the council who accepted the doctrine heard the revelation. Two members who apostatize on the count on account of the doctrine heard it. The testimony is sufficient and there can be no charge of bias. And again, the polygamy deniers don't want to deal with Leonard Sobey. They just dismiss him. He, he doesn't count. And again, in his obituary, it also says the same thing. He was not a believer in plural wives, the last sentence. He's the perfect guy. But everyone, every single person who was in contact with that document, who speaks up about that document, says it was DNC 132. Now, here's where we get to the smoking gun. Okay. there. By the way, don't hold my numbers exact. I actually think by the time I got done preparing this just a little bit ago, I think it actually ends up being 36 women total. I don't know how I missed two, but it doesn't matter. In fact, I encourage the polygamy deniers to shape these numbers to the weakest way possible and still, and still deal, deal with the statistical probability of what I'm about to share with you. Women, all I'm looking at here is 1842 to 1844, and there are clear reasons for that. I have said a while back when we did the Flora Woodworth conversation, I was behind the scenes talking to RFM and Maven and making it clear that I don't expect to see much from 1841 because number one, polygamy is not running rampant at that point. There's a few wives, I think three to five wives Joseph Smith might have had by that point. And by the way, one of them is Fanny Alger, who's gone. We don't even get to use her. So um, I use 1842 to June 27th, 1844, because that's the day the prophet's martyred. He's not going to give out any more deeds after that. I don't expect to find polygamy in 1841, at least not prevalent in the deeds. We'll, we can go through those today if you want. Uh, I don't expect to find polygamy after June 27th, 1844, dealing with Joseph Smith. Um, so I stick with those years as parameters. In those years as parameters, it is very rare for a woman to get a deed of property. So as I went through the deeds preparing for the Flora Woodworth, because I typed in her name, I was doing research on her, I saw a deed come up for Flora. I then started looking up the other plural wives of Joseph Smith. And I found lots of deeds for them. By the way, you're going to be bombarded in the comments by folks who are polygamy deniers. And they don't want to deal with this math. And I'm going to lay it out really simply. I'm, I'm hopeful that folks, that you can take my bias and set it aside, take their bias and set it aside. Um, because by the way, my ultimate conclusion doesn't matter regardless of how this issue comes out. Theirs does. Whatever arguments they make, they really don't want us to deal with this math. Between January 1st, 1842 and June 27th, 1844, there are 34 deeds given to females where no husband is on the deed. It's this cool little anomaly where almost every deed in Nauvoo is men. And we have this small chunk of deeds that are only to women or women in their siblings uh, or to women, but not with a husband on the deed. And so it's a really cool way to take a glimpse at something that's going on that's out of place. Out of place because women aren't allowed to own property. You see, in 1861, Illinois passed the Married Women's Property Act, which enabled women in, in the state of Illinois to own and manage their own real estate and keep their own earnings. No doubt patriarchy, no doubt sexism. But prior to 1861, no woman should be getting property on her own. And yet in Nauvoo in the 1840s, in 1841, there's only a handful of them, four or five. In 1845, there's only a handful of them, four or five. But in 1842, 1843, and 1844, there's a decent chunk of them. And so I'm looking at these 34 land deeds. Now, why 1844 to June 27th? We said it. Joseph is in control and polygamy, if it, if it is happening, is in full swing. And number, the number one reason is church members from the eastern states, Canada and England, had settled in and around Nauvoo by 1842. In January 1843, 
Joseph estimated that some 12,000 people lived in the area. By the way, that estimate seems to hold up. If we do, if you guys want to, you know, challenge this, by the way, I welcome it. You're welcome to redo my numbers. You're welcome to point out the math. You're welcome to take on this challenge. I would love it if a statistician or somebody else took this on. But I really do think when you see this all get laid out, the polygamy deniers have a real problem in front of them. And it's mathematically absurd to not deal with it. Okay, let's lay some groundwork. Church members from the eastern states, Canada, had settled in around Nauvoo in eight, by 1842. In January 1843, Joseph estimated that some 12,000 people lived in the area. It's the reason I chose these three years. Polygamy's going on, and the population is large enough that we can sense if, some, if there's funny business, we should be able to see funny business, right? And so there's 12,000 people in Nauvoo. And Joseph Smith allegedly had approximately 33, 34, 35 wives. Now, I recognize I can't count all 12,000 people. We're only talking about LDS females. So, by the way, I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the population in Nauvoo was more than 50% Mormon at the time. The reason the population was so large and competing with Chicago is because the, the Mormons had bought Commerce, Illinois, converted the name over to Nauvoo, and all of the Mormons who had converted in the States and outside of it were making their way to Nauvoo, Illinois. So the population of Nauvoo skyrockets to 12,000. Now, if we assume half the population is Mormon, that takes us down to 6,000. And if we assume half the 6,000 is female, then we have 3,000 LDS females in uh, Nauvoo. Now, we should account for ages, and I'm happy to do that, by the way. So even if we cut that in half again, this still becomes statistically absurd. So you're welcome to. If you'd like to, you are welcome to cut the 3,000 down to 1,500 and redo the math. That's fine with me. But there's 3,000 females. Again, some of them are going to be children. But also, we also understand the allegations at times are children. So even if we account for the number of 3,000, that would be ages 14 to 50, for instance. My hunch is that we would end up with somewhere around 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 females. But for the sake of this, we'll use 3,000. Again, I don't care what math you use. Uh, the statistical probability is absurd no matter what numbers you come up with. So Joseph has 34 alleged wives. In other words, if I'm giving out deeds of land, women are coming to me to buy land, or for whatever other reason, I'm giving land to women and saying there's an exchange of money, but there really isn't, which by the way, I think is what happens here. If I am just randomly picking an LDS female to give land to, then it would be a 1.1% chance. In other words, if I had uh, 3,000 marbles in the jar, and in fact, I even I think I even talk about that here in a moment. Um, but if I had 3,000 marbles in the jar, and they were white marbles, and then I added 34 black marbles to that jar, shook it up, made it so that they are distributed randomly and evenly, and then I reached in the jar to grab one marble out, and whether it's a white marble, which there's 3,000 of, or a black marble, which there's 34 of, the chances of it being a black marble is 1.1%. Okay? 1.1%. But now the more marbles I start taking out of the jar, the less likely it's also going to be black marbles. So... There are only 34 deeds between 1842 to 1844 that are being given to women with no husband on the deed. The more of these deeds that are taken up by these 34 alleged plural wives, the lower and lower that percentage of chance goes. The probability of half the deeds going to the 34 women rather than the rest of the population is not just slim, it is practically none, okay? And so the more times that we get a hit, meaning those 34 women, the more and more unlikely 
that it is as we keep taking marbles out of the jar. Okay. So likened it to the marbles, 3000 marbles, not black, 34 black marbles. I plugged into, I, I don't know. I don't know that the answer is right, by the way. I just know it is statistically insignificant. But when I plugged into chat GPT, and I actually asked this question to a couple of Reddit math forums as well, and they also said the same thing. The chances of the marble, of a lot of the black marbles being taken out of the jar is absurdly slim. When I plugged this into uh, chat GPT, it told me the probability was like 0.5 or 0.05%. 0.05%. It was like so low, but it was something to the right of the decimal. It is absurdly low. So what do we find when we look at these 34 land deeds? Now, again, if the polygamy deniers are right, not only is Joseph Smith not a polygamist, but Joseph Smith also is not in support of the polygamist. He is against them. They are putting John C. Bennett and Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball They're doing polygamy and Joseph is fighting it. He is trying to get rid of it. He is, he is an enemy to polygamy based on the narrative of the polygamy deniers. So what do we find in these 34 land deeds, which make up all the deeds to women without a husband listed between 1842 and June 27th, 1844. Well, first we find two deeds to Emma Smith. Joseph Smith's legal wife, and we find a deed to Mary Fielding Smith, Hiram Smith's legal wife. Okay, so now those three are accounted for. Now we're down to 31 deeds. Okay, what else do we find? Here's what we find we find deeds to Sarah Ann Whitney, Marinda Nancy Johnson Hyde, Eliza and Emily Partridge get a deed together. They also have other siblings on the deed as well. There's a deed to Sarah Scott Mulholland, Flora Ann Woodworth, Sylvia Sessions, Helen Mar Kimball, Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner, and Patty Bartlett Sessions, and Elizabeth Davis Durfee. These are all alleged plural wives of Joseph Smith. I believe there is 11 there. And each one of these, by the way, I will show my research. If you go, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go down below the video and you can look at the show notes. I put all the links of everything. So there's one document that has all the deeds from 1841 to, I think, partway into 1846. All right. So there is 11 deeds to the alleged plural wives of Joseph Smith. What else do we find? There's also a deed to Lydia Dibble Granger, who's an alleged plural wife of Hiram Smith. But that's not it. Here's what else we find. We also find two deeds, and I don't count these. If you want to throw these out, polygamy deniers, if you want to throw these two out, you're welcome to. The math doesn't get that much better for you. It's still an absurd probability. There are two deeds, one to Mary Ann Bosley, and one to a Jane Gully. And in this instance, John C. Bennett, uh, in his uh, book, History of the Saints, he names a group of Joseph Smith's plural, plural wives. This is back in 1842 or 1843. He names some of Joseph Smith's plural wives, and the historians have deciphered all of them minus two. And the two that they have not been able to come up with was uh, the last two there, which was uh, a Mrs. G and a Miss B. And because of the land deeds, I'm proposing that we actually now know who these two are. And it's Gully, by the way, the number of asterisks that Bennett included were the correct number of asterisks. In Jane Gully's uh, instance, her name is actually spelled without an E, It's G-U-L-L-Y, but that even when we look at Fawn Brody trying to figure out who that was there, and by the way, the standard uh, spelling for Gully would be an E-Y. I know there's no E. I'm simply suggesting uh, there's at least a chance that the uh, Gully Bennett 
assumed there was an E in the name when there wasn't. And Bosley works perfectly, O-S-L-E-Y. And the only reason I'm suggesting that these two now have a sort of possibility of being wives of Joseph Smith is because when we look at these 34 land deeds, they are heavily connected to Joseph Smith's polygamy. Okay? So again, for the polygamy deniers who want to make a big deal out of gully, throw them out. It doesn't matter to me. The math is so far in my favor that we can finagle this math problem at every step along the way to benefit you, and you're still going to lose in terms of probability. So we got Lydia Dibble Granger. We've got these two possibilities that Bennett uh, refers to. Um, and then what else do we find? So, so far, let's just check in. We've got three deeds, which is two women who are the legal wives of Joseph and Hiram. We've got 11 women in 10 deeds because the Partridge sisters get a deed together that are the alleged plural wives of Joseph Smith when he's not a polygamist, remember? There are two women that are two potentials, Gully and Bosley, but you're welcome to throw them out. And then we have one plural wife, alleged plural wife of Hiram Smith. That's 16 out of 34 land deeds with three of them being the legal wives and two being weak possibilities. The rest of them being plural wives of uh, alleged plural wives of either Joseph or Hiram. But wait, it gets worse. What about the other 18 deeds? Well, let's look at that. You may have to make your screen full size if you want to see these a little closer. And I want to thank Michelle Stone for helping me find these. Michelle did some research, discovered that there were other women given deeds besides the deeds I was pointing out. She passed those names on to me. She thought it would help her argument because we would have other women who are not the wives of Joseph Smith who are getting deeds. And I just want to make note, we ought to do some research on who these women are, which is what I did. And here's what we find. We have a deed to Felinda uh, Merrick. Felinda Merrick uh, is the plural wife of Vincent Knight. We have a deed to Charity Stoddard. Um, this is the wife of Sylvester B. Stoddard, who was a high priest and on the Nauvoo High Council. She died in 1844. He married uh, Elmira Knight one month later, less than one month later after Charity's death. Uh, and he was, uh, I believe, a polygamist later on. And again, I could be wrong. You're welcome to take some of these and move them over to the list we'll get to, which are the ones that are not connected to polygamy at all. There's a deed to Martha Knight. She is Vincent's legal wife, and he is a polygamist. There's a deed to Elmira Miller. He, uh, this is the wife of Henry William Miller. Council of 50 was organized in his home. By the way, we all should know by this point that the Council of 50 was highly connected to polygamy. Was organized in his home. The Nauvoo Masonic Lodge met there too. There is two, there's a conversation of two possible early polygamous marriages to an Elizabeth Smith and Nancy Baker. You can read that dialogue article. Uh, it covers uh, a lot of the original 30 men in the inner circle of polygamy, which would be deeply helpful to this conversation. There's a deed to Elizabeth Buchanan Coolidge. This is the wife of Joseph Wellington Coolidge, who was a known participant in polygamy during Joseph Smith's lifetime. There's a deed to Sally Waterman Phelps. This is W.W. Phelps' wife. He's connected to Nauvoo polygamy, but Phelps doesn't take his first plural wife until 1847. I think he actually tries to take uh, some wives without permission from Brigham Young a little earlier than that, and he ends up getting in trouble. I think he's actually either disfellowshipped or excommunicated for a short time. Uh, there's a deed to Elizabeth Matthews. She's the wife of Anson Matthews, sealed to a prolific polygamist, Samuel C. Bent, on 28th January 1846, while Anson was still alive. We have Mary Ann Price. This is Orson Hyde's plural wife from 1843. She wasn't even baptized until 1844. She joins a polygamous relationship, allegedly, in April of 1843. Uh, the deed, by the way, is April 1843. There's a deed to Melissa LeBaron Johnson. This is the wife of Benjamin Franklin Johnson, who acted as an agent for Joseph Smith in business matters. Her deed is dated for April 1844. Her husband married Mary Ann Hale as a plural wife on November 1844. 
And then there's Matilda Lyman uh, and others. In 1834, Lyman married Louisa Maria Tanner. Uh, in Kirtland, by the way, I think that's uh, uh, Amasa or Amasa uh, Lyman, uh, who is Matilda Lyman's husband, if I'm not mistaken. They had eight children in 1844. Smith taught Lyman the principle of plural marriage as he warmly grasped my hand for the last time. Lyman later recalled, Smith said, Brother Amasa, go and practice on the principles I have taught you, and God bless you. Soon, Lyman married his first and second plural wives, Deontha Walker and Caroline Partridge. In 1846, Lyman married four additional wives, Eliza Maria Partridge and Paulina Eliza Phelps. In 1851, Lyman married his eighth and final wife, Lydia Partridge, sister of his wives, Caroline and Eliza. So these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, these ten have very close connections to polygamy. So now let's check in. We have two women, three deeds are the legal wives of Joseph and Hiram, 11 women on, two, on ten deeds are the alleged plural wives of Joseph Smith. Two other women are weaker, much weaker evidence, but potential wives of Joseph Smith. We have one woman is the plural wife, allegedly, of Hiram Smith. And then we have 10 deeds heavily connected to polygamy of Joseph Smith's associates. This accounts for 26 out of the 34 land deeds that are given to women without a husband named. But wait. It gets worse. So there are some with very, they're weaker connections to polygamy, but there's still connections to polygamy. We have a deed, we have two deeds to Sarah Finney Foster. One deed is for 200 bucks. Second deed is for a thousand dollars. This is the wife of Robert Foster, who was excommunicated in 1844. He joined with William Law in publishing the Nauvoo Expositor and later became an apostle in the church law founded. Her two deeds are dated March and December. Were they an effort to keep her quiet? By the way, this isn't my research there. This was somebody on Reddit, but I think there's at least that possibility. But also I would, I would, I would also agree with the polygamy deniers. It would make more sense for her to be put into the bottom category of women who have little to no connection to polygamy. The next one is a deed to Catherine Clausen. This was a plural wife of Brigham Young, but not until 1855. Uh, she's the widow of Zechariah Clausen. She married Howard Egan as a, as a plural wife in Nauvoo in 1844. So she's actually should be on the first list. Howard Egan was called as a missionary specifically to help Joseph Smith's presidential campaign and was later in Brigham Young's, Brigham Young's Vanguard Company. And then the deed to Elizabeth Ann Smith Whitney. This is Newell K. Whitney's wife. Their daughter, Sarah Ann Whitney, got a deed as well, and she is an alleged plural wife of Joseph Smith. Um, the deed is dated September 1842, a month after the letter he sent to Newell and Elizabeth that he instructed them to burn. Now, here are the ones that have little to no connection to polygamy. Um, Lavina Murphy, Harriet Sherwood Parker, Caroline Louisa Mary Jane Smith. That's two different people. By the way, that is the children of William Smith, the prophet. And I tried to find whether William had practiced polygamy or not. I seem to remember that he was not in good standing with his brother or with the church because at some point he is trying to do polygamy. I still wouldn't feel comfortable putting him in that first list because he is the children of William Smith. Hence, I would expect Joseph Smith to find a way to include his family in giving land to them as this is all happening anyway. There's a deed to Sally Allred. Uh, a couple of folks helped me with this research. The one who did the most of it spoke at length about how the Allreds are a deeply polygamous family. They're a big part of the breakoff groups, but I couldn't find any positive identification for this Sally Allred. So I did not feel comfortable making any uh, assumption that she is tied to polygamy. There's no evidence I could find that makes that case. A deed to Sally Murdoch. This is the widow of Joseph Murdoch. He died in October of 1843. Her deed is dated November 1843. She would have been 55 years old. Her deed is dated a month after her husband's death. She never remarried, which could be seen as slightly suspicious. Could have been an under-the-radar plural wife to somebody, but I still included her in the list of folks where I see the evidence as weak or non-existent. And then there's the Mary Egan, and she has a power of attorney uh, handling her deed. 
So now here we are, 34 out of 34 land deeds. Again, Joseph Smith's alleged plural wives is 34 women. How many people are in Nauvoo practicing secret polygamy against Joseph's wishes if the polygamy deniers are right? What is it maybe? A couple hundred? 200? 300? It's still so much smaller than the larger number we're working with of 1,500 to 2,000 that we shouldn't expect these deeds to be overwhelmingly made up of either Joseph Smith's polygamy directly or the polygamy of his associates. So two women, three deeds of them are the legal wives of Joseph and Hiram. 11 women, 10 deeds are the alleged plural wives of Joseph Smith. By the way, three of those deeds are given to females under the age of 18. Helen Mar Kimball is 14 years old when she gets a deed. Flora Woodworth is 16 years old when she gets a deed. Sarah Ann Whitney is 17 years old when she gets a deed. Now, we have the two potential women. I'm happy to give those to the other side. We have the plural wife of Hiram Smith. We have 10 women heavily connected to polygamy of Joseph's associates. I think there was one woman on that list that should have went to the other list, and there was one woman on that other list that should have went to this list. So I still think there's 10 women who are heavily connected to polygamy. Again, Joseph Smith is not only not a polygamist, he is fighting polygamy. So why is he giving property to the very people he is fighting against? Now, there's also three women, four deeds with minor connections to polygamy. And then there are six women with little to no connection with polygamy. This is 34 out of 34 deeds accounted for. Think about the math on this. If there is a potential group of people, females, LDS in Nauvoo, who could get deeds. And Joseph is not a polygamist, but not only is he not a polygamist, he is fighting vehemently to get rid of this practice in the church. Then if you understand math in the law of probability, first off, we shouldn't find 11 deeds going to the plural wives of Joseph Smith, the alleged plural wives. That is such a heavy concentration. Again, the statistical probability of even just them is less than 1% by far. And then he goes ahead and he gives uh, a deed to the plural wife of Hiram Smith. And then he gives 10 deeds to other women heavily connected with polygamy when he's an enemy of polygamy and not practicing it. You see, when you do the math, that makes zero sense. And so the polygamy deniers have to deal with this. They can keep dismissing it. And by the way, they're dismissing it. I've heard things from this doesn't count because there are other deeds not given to polygamist. That's such a faulty argument. By the way, if we take this polygamy out, and I'll put it up on the screen here. This was the, the document where I kept all my research. I'll go all the way up to the top here. Um. So this is 1840 land deeds. 1840, I find Jane Miller, Maria Clark, Elizabeth Tyler, Omira A. Uh, Oaks, Hester Ann Lyons, and Cynthia Baggs. I have not done extensive research, but as far as I know, none of those have a connection to polygamy. So 1840, there is four, five, six. There are six deeds to women without a husband on the deed. And I don't think any of them are connected to polygamy. If, if any of them are, somebody can let me know. And that will put this uh, even further in my favor. But again, it's so far in my favor. I don't care what the other side does with the math. 1841 land deeds. You've got Julia Smith, who's the adopted Murdoch girl by the Smiths. You've got Polly Sherwood. That was the only 1841 land deeds I could find to women. 1842. Now the population's increasing and polygamy is starting to run rampant. There's the Philandra Merrick. There's the Emma Smith, the Charity Stoddard, Martha Knight. All the bolded is polygamy connections. Uh, Elmira Miller talks about her connection. Sarah Ann Whitney, plural wife. Caroline Louisa, Mary Jane Smith. This is William Smith's children. Harriet Sherwood Parker, Lavina Murphy. So now we're starting to get more. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine, nine deeds, I believe in uh, 42. Now we go down here to 43. Marinda Jans uh, Johnson, I'm sorry, Marinda Nancy Johnson Hyde, Eliza Partridge, Emily and Eliza Partridge. Uh, we've got Elizabeth Buchanan Coolidge, uh, Sally Allred, uh, Elizabeth Ann Whitney, Sarah Scott Mulholland, Flora Ann Woodworth, Sylvia Sessions, Helen Mar Kimball, Elizabeth, uh, Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner, Catherine Clausen, Emma Smith gets that unencumbered lots deed. Uh, Patty Bartlett, uh, Sally Waterman Phelps. Now we're up to 15. 16 is Sally Murdoch. Sarah Finney gets number 17 and 18 in the deeds. 19 to Durfee. 20 to Mary Fielding Smith. 21 to Lydia Dibble Granger. 22 to Elizabeth Matthews. 23 and 24 to Mary Egan and Mary Ann Price. That is an extreme number of deeds that doesn't match the other years. 1844, again, Joseph is killed in June, so we only have half a year. Uh, we've got the uh, Miss uh, Bosley. We've got the Melissa LeBaron Johnson. We've got the Jane Gully. We've got the Matilda Lyman. So we have four deeds, but we're only uh, halfway through the year. And as we all know, as we get closer to those last few months, Joseph Smith is completely overwhelmed with the backlash of things going on with polygamy. When we go to 1845, I found five of them. So, and again, if we take out the deeds that I'm saying are connected to polygamy, 1844 and 1843 begin to look statistically just like 1841 and 1845. And so you have to confront the fact that these deeds are saturated with polygamy. They're saturated with the allegations of the women who it is alleged Joseph Smith practiced polygamy with, and it is saturated with the women who were involved with polygamy with Joseph Smith's associates. And you have to deal with the math on that. The chances of that, the probability of that are extremely low. Not only are a third of the deeds within these parameters, Joseph's alleged plural wives, when we are strangely supposed to believe he wasn't practicing polygamy, but another third of the women are connected closely to Nauvoo polygamy. So that's two thirds of these deeds have a demonstrable connection to Nauvoo polygamy. And in the end, there is maybe three to five of these deeds with no polygamy connection. And it gets worse. They've, I've heard things like, uh, Bill, that's not how it works. You, It's hit or miss. It's a mixed bag. There's other people getting deeds. They're not the wives. That's ridiculous. Again, 34 women out of 1,500 women, and yet a third of the deeds represent those 34 women, and only two-thirds of those deeds are represented by the other 1,500. But of those, another third have connections to polygamy from a guy who is fighting it who isn't practicing it himself. I've heard people say, well, the deeds, those couldn't be, those. somebody did them in Joseph Smith's name. Well, that's really difficult. I'll show you why for two reasons. Number one, several of the deeds have Joseph Smith's signature on them, including the four I have up on the screen. But it's worse than that. If we go to the actual documents I'm using for this, uh, we'll get past here, some of the deeds. So I went to Family Search, and it's how I found all this stuff. You can go into the deed registry. It's the trustee and trust. This is the original book. So not every woman's name I have, do I have the actual deed, although I've got lots of the deeds. But there is also a registry book that just has page after page as a backup copy of the deeds that were sold in Nauvoo. And so you not only have the deeds of the plural wives, which I'm putting up on the screen right now, And the legal wives too, by the way. And this isn't all of them. But you also have this backup trustee and trust book with all of the land tra transactions. And you've got all of these women listed. And so this is where Michelle Stone had found some of these women that I could not find deeds for. And now I've gone through all of this record and I've tra tracked down every deed 
given to a female. So here's like Maria Clark. But in some of these instances, it was person to person and not trustee to trustee. I welcome, by the way, if any of you want to do additional research, you are welcome to go through these books. I may have missed a person or two. Maybe I missed 30. Maybe I missed 50. But even if you found another 50 women unconnected to polygamy, what we did find still makes this, uh, if you know the math on probability, it is so low as to be absurd. It's an absurd chance that these 34 deeds would be made up of the people that they're made up with. It's ridiculous. So um, anyway, you can go through this. You would, you would have to come up with some story where S Joseph Smith is still giving land to the polygamist in Nauvoo at a much higher rate, exponentially much higher rate than the rest of the folks in Nauvoo. And you would have to have a reason for why Joseph Smith gives 11 of these deeds to the women he's alleged to have as plural wives, but that reasoning would have to explain it in a way that they're not the plural wives of Joseph Smith. And you would have to do that in a way that acknowledges that this historical documentation by all standards appears to have contemporary provenance. And so you've got to confront this and it really is, it really is the nail in the coffin because you'd have to have so much conjecture and inference to come up with reasons for why this math happens the way it does that you would have to sound absurd. Because even if this is, you're gonna have to come up with like dynastic ceilings, eternal only marriages, but even that doesn't quite explain it. Um, especially in light of the other evidence as well. Uh, so you have this registry and then somebody, I think it includes Susan Easton Black. Yep, Susan Easton Black, Brandon Plew, Harvey Black. They took this entire registry and then they went in and wrote up a biography of sorts. It's kind of like a synopsis of the land transaction, any other land transactions juxtapose against a brief synopsis of who that person was, who they married, who their parents were, anything kind of information like that. And so you can go, each one is like uh, volume one here is A through B, volume two is C through F. And what it looks like is this, this is the A through B. And I'm just going to wait for a couple of these to open so we can show you. Let's see, that was about to open, but I thought maybe that page one was just black. So let's see what happens here. Come on. Let's try refreshing it. Oh, let's go back. So I'm gonna I just want to see what you to see what these look like. So that the people on the polygamy denier side, you're welcome to use these. Um all right, here we go. I think it signed me out, so it didn't show it. Page two, page three. We'll get to some of these. Let's skip ahead here. All right. Land partitioning. Let's go to page 15. So you can see here. So it'll it'll put the name of a person and it'll give any land transactions. So here we're looking at like uh, Arza Adams. Arza Adams, it gives information on him. It lists uh, birth dates, marriage place, marriage date, any kind of little biography information we get. And then it talks about the land transactions that he had that we have in church records. And so this was really helpful to connecting a few people to uh, their spouse or other, other folks. And so you can use this for the polygamy deniers. You're welcome uh, to deal uh, with the data and, and do this better than I did. I would welcome that, but you, you really do have to stick to 1842 to 1844 because that's when polygamy is rampant. That's when the population is high. So we can juxtapose uh, who gets the deeds versus who didn't get deeds and why that might be. Um, and so there's that. So you're welcome to do that research as well. And, and so I'm going to simply end um, polygamy deniers. You can't run from this. I know, I know polygamy disrupts you. I understand that. I understand that you abhor the practice of polygamy within Mormonism. And I know that you, on some level, you really want Joseph Smith to come out clean. And those 
two things are are deeply uh, interfering with your rational ability to understand that this is a simple math problem of probability and that nobody on your side really has a solid answer for what's going on here. And the most rational explanation for why Joseph Smith is giving 11 deeds to the alleged plural wives of his, as well as another 10 deeds to people entrenched in Nauvoo polygamy is because Joseph Smith is the founder and perpetuator of polygamy. And unfortunately, anything that doesn't tackle this problem reasonably or dismisses it out of hand is simply part of this conspiracy theory nonsense. And so you're going to have to deal with it. And I suggest that once you start dealing with it, you need to then reflect back on all of the folks who saw the document, what they said it was. Go back to William Clayton's journal and realize that we have provenance with the unencumbered lots with Emma. Look at the Nauvoo Expositor, sense that those people knew what was in 132 and were writing about it in the local newspaper at the time. And then you start to sense that, yes, I agree with you that Joseph and Hiram and Emma at various points are denying that Joseph Smith's a polygamist. But what is the possibility that they just weren't being honest, that this practice was secret, and that you're being tricked by the polygamy deniers who don't want to think with common sense and tackle these issues in a responsible way. So now I'm going to go ahead and put the banner up. You're, I'm, going to, I'm going to need to get into the call-in studio, so give me a second. Don't, don't start calling in quite yet. But I would welcome a few phone calls. I don't want any snarkiness. I don't want any, any nonsense. Um, I want you to deal with the problems, and we can talk out uh, some of these issues. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so give me a moment. I just need to get into the show. I'm going to put five calls, and it'll have a call screener. We're not talking about any other topic other than Joseph Smith's, the allegations of Joseph Smith's polygamy. And I would prefer to stick with the evidence that I presented uh, dealing with showing that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And I would love to know what your ways in which you reconcile this and how you make sense of it. So give me a second here. I need to grab my phone. Um, it's going to take me just a moment. I apologize for that. Uh, initiate outbound call. All right. Let's see if this works. Okay. So um, that's going to say it's working. I just got to turn on my Bluetooth to be connected to the roadcaster. I'm going to disconnect here. I'm sorry. Apologize for that taking a moment. I had this all done beforehand, but for whatever reason, it didn't quite work. Okay. So, folks, you are welcome to call in 662-667-6667. I would love to understand how you handle these land deeds. Um, I'd welcome it. And so, folks, if you'd like to do that, you're welcome to call in. <clears throat> and so we'll wait a few minutes. Um, I'll go back here to the beginning. I mean... The, the evidence at the front end of this is also compelling. And if you notice, folks, I'm not really speaking to the people who are just adamant that they're right. I'm speaking to those of you who have some common sense and you're going, you know what? This doesn't seem, something's off here. I can tell that Bill is posing a legitimate math problem. There is, this is really can be figured out in terms of probability. Um, and I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to believe Joseph Smith was not a polygamist if he in fact was. And I'm hoping that folks will uh, take that seriously. So I'm waiting for phone calls. Nobody's called in yet. So if you're wanting to call, feel free to. It's 662-667-6667. It's also 662 Mormons. And you're welcome to do that. I'd love to have a conversation with the deniers. I'm going to hold you accountable though. If you if you show up wanting to dismiss uh, these deeds from 1842 to 1844, you're going to have to have a good reason, or I'm certainly going to push back. Uh, so, so far, nobody's called in. 
and we'll see if anybody does. So far, nobody. Uh, I'll go back here to this beginning I was telling you about. So I know it feels like you can dismiss the William Clayton journal entries. And I understand the reasons why. I'm, I'm up to date on Mormon history. I've been spending a decade talking about it. Um, when he mentions that Emma is upset, appeared very rebellious. She didn't believe a word of it. And Joseph told me to deed all the unencumbered lots to Emma and the children. He appears much troubled about Emma. Then you go to the deed and you find that's exactly what happened. The only way to explain that away is that they retroactively, they saw the deed. They said, oh, we could use this. And then they retrofit the, uh, the William Clayton journal after the fact to look like it's uh, from before. And instead, it's actually an after uh, thought creation. And the amount of conjecture required to make that happen is absurd. The ability to dismiss William and Jane Law and Austin Cowles, who know what parts of this are and are indicating how frustrated they are with whatever this document was, you're going to need to be able to explain. You're going to need to be able to explain why these uh, descriptions match what is DC 132. In other words, the polygamy deniers agree that there was an original document. And they would have to agree, because I don't know any other way around it, even if they don't like William Law and Jane Law and Austin Cowles as apostates, they would have to agree that William Law, Jane Law, and Austin Cowles are stating things that are in DNC 132. I saw a call come in. Maven, I saw that maybe you were screening it. Uh, if that's the case, will you just put in the comments what happened there uh, with that? You would have to argue that William Law, Jane Law, and Austin Cowles are right, that whatever DNC 132, the original document was, that these parts were in it. And Jane Law tells us that this Law of Sarah, which is probably the worst part of DNC 132, is in the original document, meaning that if you're going to invent a new document that is DNC 132 that does that is not the original document, why would you take the worst part with you when you when when the original document is a good thing and DNC 132 is a bad thing? It seems strange that then DNC 132, whatever the original document is, it would have the very worst part of the later document, DNC 132. Law of Sarah, by the way, meaning that Emma gets the chance to approve future plural wives, but if she says no, oh, you tried calling yourself. Just FYI, no polygamy deniers are calling in. This should be a clue to each of you who are watching. They don't want to confront this. So I appreciate that, Maven. So far, you are the only person who has tried to call in. Um, Number is 662-667-6667. Think about it from that point. Like the document that was original pissed everybody off. It caused people to leave the church. It had all of the witnesses to the document saying, yep, that was DNC 132. And they leave their affidavits behind. They are people with multiple motivations, right? You've got um, uh, Aaron Johnson and James Allred and David Fulmer and Thomas Grover. Uh, you've got all these folks who are moving with the LDS church. So we have a reason to dismiss them. But Austin Cowles, Jane Law, and Leonard Sobey do not, do not agree uh, with the, the LDS group. And they also say that it was the actual DNC 132 that we have today. Uh, William Marks indicates that Joseph Smith did wrong. He's sort of ambiguous in places. And then in other places, he is uh, a little more favorable to Joseph, but he's a mixed bag. And then you've got that Leonard Sobey we talked about, who's the perfect witness. Um, so there's that. Uh, Maven says she's going to try again. I don't know if somebody is trying to call, but nobody's calling. No polygamy deniers are calling in. Uh, so I don't know what that, that's about. Um, they obviously don't want to tackle this conversation. 
So Leonard Sobey should be siding with them, and he doesn't. In fact, he is the person coming to him is trying to procure his testimony uh, that he that whatever was read in that high council was not Hiram Smith's presentation of the DNC 132 that we have today. By the way, he also did this. Notice this, by the way. Sobey also said he read the revelation as printed in the DNC and concluded, quote, to the best of my knowledge and belief, it is the same word for word as the revelation then read by Hiram. This is an anti-polygamist who separated from the LDS church when polygamy happened. All right. It looks like we have um, a caller. And so I'm going to just check on, on that. Hello? Hello? All right. I don't see anything there. So I'm going to return this one to the queue. I'm going to try a different one. We'll see if it's me or if it's the caller. Hello, are you there? Art? Hmm, let's see what's going on. Art, are you there? If you are, I can't hear you, so bear with me for a moment. All right, there we are. Let's try that. Art, are you there? Hello. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, my friend. Go ahead. Well, it's not Art. It's RSM, and I was calling you to see if the freaking phone lines were working. The phone lines are working great. I think there's one other guest in the queue. We'll see, uh, but it looks like they hung up. I returned them to the queue, and they hung up. What do you think, RFM? What do you think the statistical chance is that a small Zero. number of women would make up a... <laughs> A significant portion of these deeds against a larger population that is exponentially bigger. I think your work on the land deeds in Nauvoo is intriguing and pretty darn convincing. Yeah. Yeah, and when you add it together with your adding provenance to DNC 132 and with the work that we did on the other contemporary pieces of evidence, it seems almost silly at this point to posit that somehow we should trust Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith at their word when everybody else who had firsthand experience in this uh, moment in history seems to be uh, pointing to Joseph Smith being a polygamist. I know, it's like a thousand people in Nauvoo are corrupt and lying about Joseph Smith. But Joseph is the only one who's telling the truth. Joseph is the, the only lady one. who was the mother of the kid. Yeah, but it's a kid who joined the army and is having parades on the center town. She's watching it with her friend and she said, Oh, look, look at my Jimmy. Everybody is out of bed except for my Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. Your sound quality, by the way, is really bad. It sounds like maybe you're outside or something. So, uh, any other thoughts from you before I'm I. I'm calling you from the gym. Oh, you're calling from the gym. Awesome. I'm, a, I'm, I'm on a stationary bike. Gotcha. I couldn't interrupt my cardio, so I just thought I'd give you a call and make sure that the lines are open. So that all of those polygamy deniers who want to hit you with their hard evidence, yeah. the way it's clear. I'm waiting. I would love the hard evidence, but so far, uh, Maven said she was the only one who tried to call back again. So that other call, I think, was her. Uh, yep. Okay. Well, I'll get off the phone so they can all call you. Yeah, they're not, but that's okay. But thank you, my friend. Have a great day. Lift the weights. You keep, you keep doing a good, good work. Doing okay. great. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Uh, Maven, I see you're in the show. Do you want to say anything here? I'm happy to add you in if you want to. So, what do you I think, just, Maven? I just don't know if people are going to be able to hear me. Okay, can the commenters it's say a little robotic. Yeah, it's a little robotic, but I can kind of make out what you're saying. I just wanted to point out how impotent God is if you are on the polygamy denying side because you have to believe that Joseph Smith is just one shining beacon in a sea of bullshit and it's just everybody else's fault that 
anything bad put on Joseph Smith, regardless of who it's coming from, regardless of the motivation, no matter what, just has to have something against him. And not only that, but they win. They completely, I would say successfully, have undone everything Joseph was meant to do and stand for. Yeah. And I don't understand yeah. how you can come to that conclusion. Yeah, the, the 11 alleged plural wives of Joseph Smith making up one third of these deeds is incriminating on its own, by the way. But I actually think it is even more incriminating to have further connections of polygamy in another third of them. Because what that indicates is that somehow Joseph Smith is being bamboozled to give the land away to a bunch of folks who are uh, tightly entwined with polygamy. And again, he gives 11 of these deeds to the very women he is alleged to be doing polygamy with, including a 14-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 17-year-old. I think this is damning. And it all comes down to math. All you have to do is understand the law of probability, what it takes, the, the law of chance. You know, if I go to a craps table or a roulette table, all of those games are rigged on chance and they're all in the casino's favor. Um, when you have 1,500 potential females and only 34 of them are the wives of Joseph Smith, you should not find a third of 34 land deeds given to those women. And because it is, it is so, it's so unlikely. You should expect to find, like I said at the beginning, about 1%. If I just took one marble out of the jar, 1% chance that it would be the marble that is in the lower uh, amount color-wise, 35 black, 34 black, 1,500 white marbles, right? Um, but the more marbles I take and the more those marbles continue to be black, the lower and lower and lower that statistical chance goes to the point where when you do the math to have a third of them be those women is like 0 0.05%. Uh, and folks are welcome to call in. Um, and you know, you can leave your comments in the, in the YouTube stuff, but all the research is there. Folks are welcome to tackle it. I'm going to start to end the show here. Nobody called in. Um, I don't know why that, you know, again, folks don't seem to want to challenge this face-to-face, uh, -face, voice to voice. I would welcome that. And if somebody wants to set up a time to, by the way, I'll say this to the polygamy deniers. Michelle Stone at first said she would, although now she is not saying she wants to do it. She sees my attack on her as ad hominem. I'm simply pointing out the ridiculousness of her dismissing evidence like this. Um, I would welcome, if there's an informed, intelligent polygamy denier out there, I would welcome you and me sitting down for two or three hours and talking about all of this stuff. And you can present what you think is the strongest evidence. I'll present what I think is the strongest evidence. I'll poke holes in your evidence. You poke holes in mine. I would welcome that. Um, by the way, EJS said all two of us that are watching uh, there's 84 people watching right now. And again, by the time this is all done, there'll be thousands of people who watch this. Uh, so you're welcome to, um, but folks, I would welcome it. I would welcome a conversation and you can publish it on your YouTube channel. You can put it in, in your podcast as well. I don't need to only own the content. Uh, I don't need that. So I would welcome that conversation, but as of now, I'm going to end the, I'm going to end the show. No one called in. Uh, sorry, it's two o'clock in the afternoon when I started this, but that's because that's the time I've got today to do it. I've got things going on this evening. So um, if you have a good reason, if you will acknowledge that on a, as, as a math problem of probability, you understand the issue and you are willing to offer a reasonable solution to why these deeds are saturated with polygamy. I would welcome it, especially knowing Joseph Smith isn't a polygamist and is fighting against it. Otherwise, I'm going to end the show. Have a great day, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll spend another minute here kind of going through the comments just to see if there's any questions. I'm just kind of flipping through. Um, you know, I hear people saying what a joke and all that kind of stuff, but no one's actually dealing with the problem, I don't think. Uh, if somebody saw somebody dealing with the problem, maven, if you saw somebody actually dealing with the problem, feel free to star their 
their comments and I will I will take a look at that. Everybody says bullshit. Everybody said, you know, I should say everybody, but this small group of polygamy deniers, they say bullshit. They say you're crazy. You just you just side with the church. You make your money off your podcast, but not one of them is offering a reasonable explanation to what I think is just a com, you know, a complex math problem that doesn't end in their favor. I'm just flipping through really quick. And again, I see things about people trying to dismiss William Clayton's journal entries. Everyone who's dealt with those journal entries from believing and non-believing sides, they have multiple motivations, have, again, limited people have been allowed to see it. Shame on the LDS church for not releasing them. Rumor is they're getting ready to actually release them. Um, shame on the LDS church for keeping them hidden away for so long. But the folks who have had interaction with them, there's no question about the provenance or the uh, historical validity of those documents. Um, anyway, I'm flipping through. I don't see any questions. I'm going to end the show. Everybody have a great day. Uh, I hope that for folks who are on the fence, who are willing to think rationally, you recognize the absurdity of this math problem uh, in terms of how it can end in the polygamy deniers favor is just slim to none and slim just, uh, just